This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, Episode 70. Whoa, oh, oh. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood. I'm here with my bald and beautiful co-host, Chris Graham. Chris, how are you doing today, buddy? Oh, hey, Brian. I'm great. And do you know why I'm great? Why? Because this weekend we get to hang out again, which means we will have hung out every two weeks for <laughs> three weeks in a row. And we had only met in person one time before that. Dude, we're taking our relationship to the next level. I love it. It's true. And I'm pumped because you are taking your relationship to the next level with your fiance this weekend. What a segue, dude. That's like (laughs) next level, (laughs) wonderful pro shit right there. Yeah, I'm getting married Saturday. I'm kind of nervous, but really excited. And I'm just ready to get it done. (laughs) (laughs) The pending, like all the stress and all the stuff that comes up before the wedding, like all that stuff is always fun to deal with as if I've done it. I'm a regular, (laughs) (laughs) but this is like the kind of stuff before any big project starts, which I would call a wedding, a definite project. Sure. Yeah. I'm excited is all I'm trying to say. Yeah. I'm pumped, man. For those of you that might've missed earlier, I have the honor of being a groomsman. Oh, I got all my clothes. I bought brand new shoes, a brand new belt, a brand new strap for my watch. We did your bachelor party about a week ago, yep. which was freaking Yosemite. Yep. We talked about that on the last episode, I think. Well, if you guys didn't catch that, I highly recommend that you go to Yosemite and I highly recommend that you do it when they're having more snow than they've had in the past 40 years. Yeah. yeah, That was a heck of a trip. Awesome. Coming from someone who's from Alabama, I'm not used to snow. Well, let's move on to our episode today because we have an awesome guest on the show today. His name is Bjorkvin Benedictsson from audioissues.com. Bjorkvin, welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you. Great to be here. And I am very familiar with the snow, so just wanted to put that up. <laughs> got, here's the thing. Let me just stop you right there. There's always like people like me from the South who like, if there's like an inch of snow, it's like the end of the world. We're not doing anything. But then there's always that like one guy in the group that's like, oh, I don't get why all these people don't. Like, <laughs> they're like the old grizzled snow veteran. So that's you, Bjorkman. You're the old grizzled snow veteran. Well, it's not like Bjorkman's from somewhere where there's so much snow <laughs> that it's in the name of the country. Bjorkman's from Iceland. Yeah. But now I live in Tucson, Arizona. That's like 300 days of sun and most, you know, goes up to like 110 degrees in the summer. Cool. And if it drops down to like below 40 degrees Fahrenheit here, I just fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I tell everybody when I'm complaining about the snow or complaining about the temperature, they're like, you're from Iceland, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I didn't move to the fucking desert to be cold. <laughs> I didn't come here from Iceland, <laughs> from the motherland, to, to still be cold. Well, the reason we got Bjorkman on the show today is because he is in our opinions, the master of email marketing. We talked about this a little bit last week with Joe Gilder. We talked about building a mailing list. This has been a very effective part of Chris Graham's marketing for his business. And we thought we'd bring Bjorkman on to talk to us about why email marketing is so powerful and then how you can incorporate it into your businesses. Let me tell you a little bit more about who Bjorkvin is. So Brian and I met through a mastermind group that Lid Shaw of the Recording Studio Rockstars podcast puts on. And it's a bunch of like audio guys who have blogs, YouTube channels, or podcasts. And for some reason, Lidge invited me, despite the fact that I had none of these things <laughs> at the time. And I was in a little bit of a weird position in that Chris Graham Mastering was, you know, very successful And I had a humongous email list. It was like 30,000 people that had signed up to create an account on Chris Graham Mastering over the past, at the time, I guess it'd be like eight years or nine years or something like that. And I was absolutely terrified to ever email everyone on the list because I thought (laughs) I would get like branded as a spammer and ostracized. And I had a lot of fear issues. And the first time Brian Hood came to Blamo was because Bjorgvin invited him. So just so you guys are aware, Bjorgvin is single-handedly responsible for the formation of this podcast by introducing me to Chris Graham, just so everyone is aware. (laughs) This is true. It was like love at first conversation because we went down spreadsheet tangents. I like being the connector, you know? 
Yes. So back to your story, Chris. <laughs> that was a reference to uh, the Go Giver. Yeah. You guys need to read that Great book. book. <laughs> it's incredible. Also, the reason for this podcast. And so I was on this Blamo mastermind call. And one of the things that are great about a mastermind is that you can be vulnerable and open about the things that you are struggling with. And I knew, because I'd heard everybody on the Blamo mastermind call talk about email marketing, and I'd heard a lot of other people talk about, oh, it's the number one marketing channel for almost all businesses. It's the cheapest marketing channel. It's the most effective. And so I kind of, you know, got my courage up and I said to the group, I said, well, guys, I have something to confess. I have an email list with 30,000 people on it, of people that have signed up to my website and I have never emailed them. Uh, I remember that moment. I, <laughs> I was just, oh God, what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, I physically feel ill. <laughs> yes. So it was a magic moment because it was when I met Brian, but Bjorgvin kind of took me under his wing and started coaching me on how to use that email list. I'll never forget sending that first mass email that was like, hey guys, uh, you might have signed up up to and including eight years ago. I'm going to begin to email you guys sometimes with helpful information about mixing your songs and stuff. And it was so scary. And like, I emailed like 30,000 people and like six people were like, this is spam, which doesn't do anything. Oh God. Six people out of 30,000. Yeah. Like, so the incredible response rate. And I was blown away that like all of a sudden, all these customers that I hadn't talked to in like five or six years were like, I'm going to hire you this week. And it was just this crazy explosion of growth for my business. Like I was on another podcast at the time called the guitar knobs that I had no idea what I was doing. And I just like stopped showing up to record because I had so many more mastering projects. I could only handle mastering and no other extracurricular activities. Just to like emphasize the importance of these like 30,000 emails that he has just access to because he's engaged with those people before, even if it was one time, you know? Yeah. And so like when you're ready and you're like pretty advanced with your email marketing and you know that you have an email marketing system that works and like a funnel that works, you have the ability to put a lot of people through it without just kind of getting overwhelmed. But then you might want to do like paid advertising or things like that. And I do a lot of paid ads. I spent uh, over $100 a day on advertising on Facebook and Instagram just to get people onto my email list and sort of grow my subscriber base that way, giving them helpful content and like free PDFs and eBooks and that sort of stuff on audio issues. Just to put that into perspective, 30,000 email subscribers to me is worth, because I pay a dollar to... Two to three dollars per email on Facebook advertising. That means that if I would have paid for that list, I would have paid 30 to 90 grand for that list of emails and knowing that I can make a return on my investment. And he just has this sitting around. It's like finding $30,000 <laughs> under your like cushions of your couch. <laughs> yeah. And that's, yeah, that's the, the numbers are right on there. The growth was bananas after that. And I think, let me bring this home for you guys listening. Cause I know some of you are thinking like email marketing, what are they talking about? How does this help me? And I think the vision I want to cast for you guys is what email marketing is. I'm going to kind of define it. And then we're going to have Bjorgvin just freaking blow our minds and drop wisdom nuggets all <laughs> over us. So that sounded gross. I don't want, we, we, <laughs> no, no, leave it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to leave it. So with email marketing, it's amazing because when people come to your website, if you give them something free, my thing is the free mastering sample. If you give them something for free, they'll give you their email address. And once you have their email address, if you continue to serve them by providing value, you know, if you're a mix engineer, you own a recording studio, it could be like, you know, songwriting tips, or it could be tips on how to record better vocals, or, you know, fill in the blank. There's any number of ways that you could provide free value to your potential customers. And if you have this giant email list and you're trying to fill up your calendar with paid gigs and you have some openings, you can email the whole list with, you know, cool, interesting information that my whole list will love. And by the way, I have this week available in a month. It's this massively powerful channel that you own. So Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all of these things, you can build a huge following on there. But if they change their algorithm, you can no longer reach your audience. 
Email marketing is so much cheaper to use and you own it. Right. Why build an email list, people ask. And the thing that I think is so important when it comes to email versus something like social media or posting on Facebook or posting on your blog and hoping people will see it that way is that even if they're your greatest fan, even if they're, they like love everything you put out and will eventually buy everything you publish, uh, they don't check your stuff every day. They don't go on your website every day. Like Facebook's certainly not going to show them your stuff every day. Your stuff's not going to come across their Instagram scroll while they're on the bathroom every day. But everybody checks their email at least once a day, if not incessantly throughout the day. We still do that. There's definitely been an increase in sort of the like people just getting exhausted with emails. But at that point, it becomes even more valuable and more important to be better at email marketing and be better at being authentic, sharing yourself, sharing your stories, creating a relationship with your fans and your subscribers, because it gives you direct access to your fans, to your subscribers. It's trackable. You know exactly like how many people open stuff. You can create a bunch of systems around that sort of stuff and you can keep in touch. It's like the easiest way to keep in touch. And I like thinking about it as just sending people letters, you know? People have been sending letters in the last hundreds and hundreds of years. People have been sending letters to each other. And this is just me sending like, hey, here's an update of what's going on with me. And like you said before, you might mention something valuable and then you mention something that is maybe something that a small percentage of them or your audience or your subscribers might be interested in knowing more about and therefore possibly becoming your customers. I think at this point, it's really important that we put ourselves, I'm going to put myself in the, our listener's shoes as best that I can. We have so many different listeners and so many different backgrounds and genres and niches that there's no way I can put myself in everyone's shoes, but I'm going to put myself in what in my mind our avatar is. I am an average home studio owner. I'm doing this maybe part-time or even full-time. Let's just say I listened to last week's episode with Joe Gilder. I have started building an email list of some sort by giving away some sort of free thing by giving a call to action that specifically requests them to go take an action on my website to download that free thing. Go listen to that episode. It's gold when it comes to building a mailing list. So now I'm building this mailing list. I'm Chris Graham. I don't want to get to the point where I'm Chris Graham with 30,000 people on my mailing list and I've never emailed them. What do I start doing as I'm building a mailing list without A, being annoying, B, running out of things to talk about, and C, without pissing... Actually, that's the first thing. C, but while still making some sort of income, making it worth my time. Right. So like the best practices is... How to not be annoying, I feel like, is being personal, you know, being yourself, being authentic. From my point of view, like, I like sharing stupid stories. I tend to share a lot of stupid stories about what happens to me, and then I sort of relate it to something that might be interesting to them about audio or mixing, whatever. If you're a home studio owner, you can think of it as you can talk about any cool story that happens in the studio. You can create FOMO for people on your email list. FOMO is fear of missing out if people don't understand that. Right. So it's like this stuff is happening in the studio like every week or I, I'm thinking about these funny things. And if you're known to be like a funny and, and personable guy, you just try to make that shine through in your emails so that you create a relationship with the people on your email list. And then you share your sessions, you share things that you worked on. If you've mixed a record, you can write an email about how you did it. And if musicians or bands are on your email list at that point, they might be interested in contacting you and working with you. So when you talked about sharing personal stories from your day-to-day -day life or from your week-to-week -week life, is there some system or some method you use to start tracking those potential stories that you can flesh out later? Like, do you pull out an Evernote file? Are you doing voice memos? Like, how are you... Because I know yeah. you write a lot of content. So the yep. average person probably just doesn't know the way to even start storing those things for later. Sure. Well, there's a few different things. I use Wunderlist and I jot down, like I just have a list that has post slash story ideas. These range from like, one of the things I really like doing is using analogies. So how one thing is like something completely different. An example I use all the time is how Audio editing is like doing the dishes if cooking is like mixing because you have to do the dishes before you start cooking or you have to prep 
the meal before you start cooking it. It's even worse if you don't do the dishes after cooking your meal. Then you have to do the dishes before and after cooking. And I think audio editing is one of the most boring parts of audio production, and that's why I think that that analogy works so well. It's like you got to do your audio editing so that you can make your mixing more fun. So you're just tracking these ideas in Wonderlist, and that link to that will be in our show notes for those of you who go to the sixfigurehomestudio.com/slash seventy. That's slash seven zero. There'll be a link to that specific app. Uh, I think it's desktop and iPhone, correct? Yeah. And then I keep track of all questions I get. So if I get questions from subscribers, I keep track of that. Anytime somebody sends me like a testimonial or I find a review on Amazon for one of my books, I keep track of that so that I can, you know, say Benjamin really liked step by step mixing and it helped him do X, Y, and Z. Then I can structure an email based on that archetype, and I talk about well, usually. Say Benjamin, like he really learned how to use compression very effectively, and maybe I'll share a snippet from the book, you know, something to give them a sneak peek into the book. And then, if you're like Benjamin, I don't know why his name is Benjamin, but whatever, <laughs> <laughs> then you might want to read this book as well because it sort of puts them in the same camp as my previous customers. One of the things we failed to mention when we introed you is that not only have you probably sent more audio related emails as far as email marketing goes than anybody on the face of the planet, you are also <laughs> one of the best selling authors in the audio, like how to book space on Amazon. Yeah. You've got a bunch of best selling books on there about recording and mixing and editing and the whole nine yards. So Bjorkman is like, a particularly impressive dude because one, he's an amazing marketer, two, he's an amazing audio engineer, and three, he speaks like, what, five, six <laughs> languages? I only speak three, but I uh, know six. Okay. So his native language is not English, yet it's his business is English. And it embarrasses me because he's so much better at it than <laughs> I am. I've been doing it for 36 years. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> I commented on one of your posts the other day on Facebook about how impressive your English skills were. And I definitely had some grammatical errors. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Let me kind of pull this in. Let me create a scenario here. Okay. So earlier today, I had a conversation with a good friend of the podcast, Andy Reid, up in Bay City, Michigan. He owns a very successful recording studio up there which is super impressive because Michigan is not like a massive market. It's not like a super amazing place to run a recording studio, but Andy's doing great. Let's use Andy since he's top of mind for me as an example here. So Andy's in Michigan. Andy has figured out some sort of newsletter, some sort of reason to get people to sign up. So let's say he does something like the Michigan music scene newsletter. And it's basically, you know, he is writing about things that are going on. Hey, this record came out. It's a really big deal up in Traverse City. And then this record came out that's doing really, really well from Grand Rapids. And hey, they're building this new venue in Ann Arbor. Da, 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 da. So all of a sudden, all these people in Ann Arbor who are musicians begin to subscribe to this newsletter because it addresses something they're interested in. Now, the other thing that's happening that's interesting is everyone that would subscribe to a music scene email letter in Michigan for Michigan is also a potential customer for Andy. So as Andy builds this list and cultivates a relationship with them, he also has the ability to, at the end of an email, say, hey, by the way, for any of you musicians looking for a recording studio, yada, 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 yada. So it's this amazing thing where by giving away something for free, by serving people, he now has this huge platform that he can use to generate business for free for his recording studio. So let's put ourselves in Andy's shoes here, Bjorgman. If Andy wants to build this newsletter and get, even if it's just hundreds of people, even if it's like the right hundred, few hundred people in Michigan that are all in like influential bands or whatever, that's still a really valuable email list if they're all perfect high dollar customers for him. So what advice would you have for someone like Andy that's trying to build an email list to get more customers for their studio? That idea for a newsletter is so cool because it starts with value. It doesn't start with selling services. It starts with how can I, how can I bring something to the community that 
people want to be a part of, right? So it starts with that. And then one of the things that I think is very important is the consistency. So like, there's no need for a newsletter every day about the scene. There's a need maybe every week, every other week, whatever the scene sort of commands, right? He could make it even sort of like the newsletter sort of stand on its own as its separate entity, which it sort of does from the beginning, and be like sponsored by Andy's studio. Ooh. Even though he's technically the same entity, it could be like brought to you by Andy's studio. I don't know what we would call that, but create all this goodwill for Andy's studio because all the musicians that are being featured on here are getting shout outs from something that the entire scene finds valuable. It's creating all this goodwill. And that's one of the things you cannot buy. You cannot buy goodwill. You cannot buy like public relations. You can certainly like buy it or hire a publicist, but that's an entirely different beast. You know, like getting goodwill from being like the dude in the scene that talks about the scene and loves the scene so much. I can't make a Facebook ad about that, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could obviously advertise the newsletter, but like, I think it starts with value and is consistent and becomes an integral part of what the scene, I guess, demands or wants. And then inserting his personality into it, becoming sort of the voice or the authority on the scene, that commands even more attention for all the bands that are around there. He might, at that point, become the person that they talk about amongst themselves. It becomes a word of mouth kind of thing because they're never really talking about the studio. They're never really talking about the guy that's always trying to like record them or trying to like hit them up for, you know, wanting to do their next mix or whatever. He's become the guy that loves the scene more than the scene loves itself almost, you know? I see this in the real estate market a lot. And because I'm like a marketing mind, I always am noticing things. I'm always analyzing things and what are people's motives in certain scenarios. And I go to live meetups here in Nashville that are real estate related. And there are always what I call hawks, like circling the room. There's always <laughs> that mortgage broker. There's always that insurance guy. There's always that insert ancillary service related to real estate and or realtors. And they always hang out in these groups, not necessarily to add value and gain value from the groups, but to sell their services to these groups. And there's two separate groups within that. There's the groups that are just trying to sell their services and hawk their shit at you. And then there's the group that sponsors the group. They're the one that makes the group possible. They're the ones that actively invest themselves. They're actively participating. They're adding value. They're having good conversations. They're speaking and educating at these events. And they're an integral part of the actual group itself. And those are the people that actually get hired when it comes time for getting title insurance, for getting a mortgage broker. Those are the people that always get hired. So when we take this back to the studio world, especially related to this newsletter idea that Chris is talking about here, if you are essentially associated with a positive thing in your industry, building that goodwill that Bjorkman was talking about, that cannot be purchased. It cannot be sold. It is one of those things that you have to build yourself. And it isn't free. It doesn't cost any money, but it isn't free because you have to put yourself, you have to invest yourself into something and you have to actually give a damn and not have some ulterior motive. Now, it's this tricky dichotomy because you have, there's always on the back of your mind, you do want the business. You are in business for one thing. And that is to like actually make a living doing something you love to do. But the second side of that is you have to be willing to provide value with no strings attached. And I see this in the real estate market all the time. People that always have that string attached to anything they do. And those people never succeed. It's always the people who are open-handedly giving things away and not expecting anything in return. Those are the people that succeed, and it's the same in the music industry as well. And going back to um, Andy uh, as well, it's one of the things that I really like creating and what I see most brands kind of fail at because they just simply don't have them are like welcome sequences. Ooh. So these are automatic email sequences that are created and crafted. Let's be honest, like these are crafted things. These aren't just haphazard emails that are thrown out. Like my welcome email sequence is very, very long, actually, but it's all the best content and all the funniest stories and everything like that. Let's kind of clarify what you mean by welcome sequence. For those of us that have no idea what email marketing is, what is a welcome sequence? So like, let me put that into perspective using Andy's analogy as well. 
I would say that a welcome sequence is basically a simple system that introduces you, your brand, what you do, how you do it, and why you do it, and what the subscriber should expect to get. So in this case, the welcome email usually delivers whatever they signed up for. Maybe a little tidbit extra. In my case, I ask people what they're struggling with and how I can help them with their audio production by filling out a survey, or they sometimes just reply to the email. That's fine too. And just in that one email, I've managed to create goodwill because I'm giving them something free that is valuable. And I'm also engaging with them by asking them to engage with me. And I actually personally respond to every single survey response, which is not scalable, but it is worth it. And then you create the back and forth engagement with them. You create a relationship and you basically get information from them on what you can create content-wise, what they want from you in the future. So just with one automatic email, the beginning of the sequence gives you engagement, goodwill, uh, a relationship, and market research or customer research to further your email marketing. And then from there, I don't believe in there only being one best welcome sequence. It really depends on what you're selling, what you're promoting, what you're doing, how you've structured your business or your brand or your studio. But it could be something along the lines of the second email, whether that's the day after or three days after, or maybe it's weekly, whatever. And that gets automatically triggered. So they sign up, they get a welcome email two, three days later, they automatically get another email two, three days later, they get another and so on. And in my case, I like sharing my story. So I like sharing sort of like, you know, to quote sort of the comic book style origin story, you know, like Peter Parker got bit by a spider or whatever, Superman's from Krypton and all that. Like that's the origin story, right? My origin story is like I learned live sound in Iceland and I did a bunch of live sound for uh, underground indie clubs and big festivals. And then I moved to Spain and studied audio engineering in Spain. And then I moved to Arizona and now I live in Arizona. I'm more as an audio educator and like a music and a mixing coach. And I'm a musician, an entrepreneur and an author on the side. So it's like I was once just like a live engineer that was trying to figure out how EQ worked, you know? So that's sort of introducing me and it's sharing a personal story. And then you can go in any different direction depending on your brand. Well, I've got an idea here. So back to Andy Reid. And so Andy's studio is called the Reid Recording Company. So check him out, especially if you're in Michigan. But let's say I'm Andy and my ideal customer is rock bands. And so I think about, well, what do all rock bands in Michigan want? Hmm, you know what I bet they want? I bet they want a list of all the booking agents at all the venues in Michigan. I am going to either accumulate all that information myself or I'm going to hire an assistant and I am going to say, hey, sign up for the Michigan Music Scene newsletter and you can get a free list of all the booking agents in Michigan. Boom. They sign up for the email list. Every potential band that wants to work with Andy in Michigan is like, oh, I want that. Awesome. Signed up. Boom. They get an automatic email. It's got all the information in there. It's completely free. A couple days later, Andy has another email that goes out automatically that maybe is like, bonus, here's a list of all the venues in northern Ohio and northern Indiana, which is the states to the south. And then continues to, you know, three, four days later is like, hey, here's my five-step guide to how to get a show for your first time at a new venue. And so he starts sending these emails out and he is training people that, hey, when I email you, it's the good stuff. Right. You're going to want to open these emails. It's the really good stuff. It can really help you. And then occasionally as stuff happens, say a new venue opens up or there's a battle of the bands or whatever, Andy's sort of a news organization as well. So he's sending out these unautomated emails that are like, okay, cool. I've got 500 people on the list. This thing happened that they should all know about. I'm going to tell them. And I love your idea about like, you know, the Michigan music scene newsletter sponsored by the Reed recording company. That is freaking cool. And eventually Andy's got this massively powerful tool where he can occasionally just hop in and be like, Hey guys, you know, Andy from the Michigan music scene newsletter here. You know, I also own the Reed recording company. If anyone's looking to record, I do have availability the second week in August. Boom. Yeah, exactly. And doing that on a limited time basis and also for a limited time would be preferable too. If you can introduce scarcity elements of like book before a certain date, 
you get maybe like an extra song mixed or a f- free mastering of, or maybe like extra half day in the studio or an extra mix revision or whatever, just to give people an incentive to buy now, as opposed to like buy whenever they may need to do so in the future. And one of the things that Andy could do too is because he's sending out all these great tidbits and that people know that they want to know more about, it also gives them an opportunity is like, hey, I've been sending you this because I knew that you were telling me that you wanted to know about more venues to book at or this, that, and the other thing. What else can I do to help? Like, what else can I share about? And if he collects these responses via a survey software of some sort or whatnot, or just manually via email, sooner or later, he's going to start noticing a trend. And at that point, it's like, oh, the thing that people are most often asking for is this. Let's make content about this. Or let's do another curated list of the best amp techs or like the best luthiers to set up your guitars or even just a guide on how to do it yourself, you know? And he can put that in the rotation. He can put that in like an automatic rotation. And at that point, it just serves as a content or a piece of value. Yeah, and what's so cool about this idea is if Andy can craft an email sequence that provides incredible value, say it's five emails long or 10 emails long, say it's one email a day, you hit on this as well. Like the consistency I think is really key. He should send out at regular intervals, say every Tuesday or something like that, or every other Tuesday or the first and the 15th of each month. So he begins to set that expectation of here's when to expect it. But he also sets that expectation of like tons of value that these are if you want to be part of the Michigan music scene, you sure as heck better have read the most recent email. And if he does that, then man, what an amazing and powerful position to be in for him to not only get more customers for his recording studio, but I can definitely speak on behalf of Brian and I for the podcast. like, this is kind of what we do. You know, the podcast is a free way that we try to help as many people as possible and serve as many people as possible. And it just continues to open the most weird and unexpected doors for us in our businesses and in our ability to be friends with cool people. So this is an interesting idea that I think so many of our listeners could just immediately be like, hey, I could do that in uh, North Dakota. Boom. And off to the races you go. And now you suddenly have the ability to drum up business for your studio but you also have the ability to do a lot of other things. Say you want to host a battle of the bands or say you want to launch a music festival or say you fill in the freaking blank. You have this email list that loves you, that opens your emails and you can hit out of the park. I thought I would say, basically people might be listening to this and going like, either I could do that or it's like, oh, that sounds way too complicated. Or I don't know about crafting something. Like, I don't know how to write something like that or whatever. You don't have to do that. Like I have 10 years of experience doing this and I'm still learning. If you can tell your friend a story of what happened to you last weekend and you can write five emails to your friends, you can do an email marketing sequence. If you want like an advanced tip, make an email marketing welcome sequence that is a series that continues on to the next email. Say you start in email one, you start telling a story, you leave the story with a cliffhanger. If you want to know what happens next, or if you need the next information in the sequence, open the next email. Yeah, I think Dorfman's touching on a very important thing here that definitely needs to be addressed. And I, as I listen to this interview myself, I think this is a lot of work. Because I see from both sides. I have a studio. And to be honest, my studio, I do no email marketing at all. And I'm just fine. So just so everyone listening knows, it's not 100% necessary that you do this. But it is very powerful. And I've seen it on the other side with the Six Figure Home Studio where content is my main strategy. I know that it's very effective. And I know that it's a lot of work to set this stuff up, not only from a technology standpoint, but from just a time suck of actually putting the pieces into place and learning how to do this well. I've seen a lot of shitty emails in my life from people who try to do this and are terrible at it. So my thought goes to immediately, what's the 80-20 principle for email marketing? What is the 20% that I can do that's going to give me 80% of my results? And I think you kind of just touched on it there. It is finding just a simple email sequence that gets people warmed up to who you are, provides value to them, and then hopefully, if you can set a long-term one, keeps you top of mind for this band or musician so that when it comes time for them to book a studio, you are the last name they have heard of when it comes to a recording studio. And that is by itself, terrible email or not, it is a very powerful thing to just be top of mind. 
it's the thing. It's like it's top of mind awareness because Coke doesn't spend billions of dollars or whatever on advertising every year because they think that everybody's gonna like immediately go and buy a Coke whenever they see a Coke commercial. It's the fact that whenever they're thirsty, they think of a Coke. Top of mind. I say this in jest, but I email a lot. I email every day, and I try to have a ratio of like value or information that is entertaining plus a little sales pitch at the end. What's the ratio? It's usually, you know, 70-30. It's usually just, you know, some value. And then if you like this or if you wanted more tips like these, check out, da 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 And maybe I'll add a testimonial or I'll add a little bit extra there psychology-wise. But basically this main strategy is like just be top of mind and follow up until they either don't need you, which is fine, or they become your customer and like your stuff, which is better, <laughs> obviously. But you know, you're not going to convert 100% of your subscribers to customers. It just will not happen. You know, you should be lucky with like one to five percent. And people don't unsubscribe to emails like en masse. They'll unsubscribe for a multitude of reasons. Like I unsubscribe to emails that I like just because I'm like, I don't really need this anymore. You know, like this is just cluttering up my inbox. Maybe somebody was a musician and now they're not, you know, there's no reason for them to be on your email list at that point. I think this would be a good time to kind of talk about the technology behind actually putting together an email list and an autoresponder sequence, because for a lot of people, I'd say probably most people listening to this podcast, this is a foreign language, a foreign world. They don't understand even the basics of, and that's not an insult. It's just, this is not what we learn as audio engineers. It's not sure as shit isn't taught in audio schools anywhere, but it's also not taught on YouTube videos. This is not part of the traditional business model for a recording studio. Most guys are not doing this. So again, it's just untaught. So what can someone do quickly and easily to get started as far as technology wise? If you're starting from scratch, I always recommend MailChimp, even though I don't use it because it is free up to 2000 people. If you have more than 2000 people on your email list, well, once you have more than 2000 people on your email list, you should have also dedicated the time to know how to get an ROI on the $30 a month it costs or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But if you're starting from scratch, get a MailChimp account. And first, figure out who your audience is and how you can serve them. And then if there's a quick solution to their problem, maybe a list of some sort, going back to Reed Recording Company, if there's a list of venues or a list of whatever. In my case, it's like a quick solution, but it's actually like a list of EQ tips. So I offer a list of EQ tips for anybody who subscribes to the email list. And then I have an origin story or an intro sequence. So you just have to write five emails to a friend and be fun and friendly and offer them something cool. And then once you have that, you set that up in MailChimp. You subscribe yourself. You go through the sequence first. You make sure it all works and it makes sense. And you have your calls to actions correctly, do all the grammar and the syntax and you know the spell check and all that sort of stuff. And then you create a landing page using something like well, lead pages or any sort of landing page software out there. Wix and Squarespace, those all integrate with MailChimp. So worst case scenario, you can. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So you just make a page on your web page that, you know, the easiest way would just be do like headline that has the benefit driven headline that offers whatever it is that you're giving away for free. Uh, the benefits of getting that thing by signing up a call to action that says sign up, you know, <laughs> and like get my free checklist or like I want the free checklist or whatever. And then a link to sign up, whether that's an opt-in box where you sign up directly on the page or a link that pops up something. I think everyone here has at least experienced this from the other side. So I think everyone understands that side of things. But the thing is that it doesn't matter which way you do it, as long as you have one way that works. You know, you can always get better. You can always like tweak your landing page. I'm constantly tweaking my copy, my software, my email sequences, my headlines, all this stuff. So if you think you're going to set up like the perfect landing page with the perfect email sequence from the start, you are deluding yourself. <laughs> I think you should start somewhere and just go from there. Well, I think one of the cool things to kind of bring home, just to make sure everyone that's listening gets this, is we preach on the podcast all the time 
the thing that we're talking about here first and foremost is serving other people. And I think one of the biggest mistakes audio engineers make, and this isn't just us as audio engineers, this is everybody, is they have this like, well, I want to I want to get paid what I'm worth. And that's all about extracting value from other people because they deserve it. They have this sense of entitlement. What Bjorkman's preaching here and what we preach all the time in the podcast is completely the opposite. It's find people who have a need and serve them in the biggest way that you possibly can. That's what I'm freaking doing right now with this podcast is Brian and I are trying to serve you guys by teaching you valuable information that can help you. And we believe that if you do that, if you go out and help as many people as you possibly can, ideally through mass media like email marketing or podcasting or blogging or YouTubing or something like that, that it generates a lot of opportunity for you to convert those people into customers in the future. And this is a service mentality, not a what am I worth mentality. And everything that we're talking about kind of comes back to this. And Bjorkman mentioned it earlier. He hinted at it earlier, this book, The Go-Giver, which is just a massively awesome book about this thing, about serving people and about putting you in a position to think about how you can serve people. If you can serve a lot of people, you're going to find a way to make margin, to make profit in the extra, in the outside, in the margins of whatever you're having to do to serve people. Yeah, no, exactly. And like, you know, I hinted at, I didn't mention the book, but like, start small and do it like a little bit at a time. And and that goes back to like the, you've all read the one thing is that the reason comparison syndrome, when you're comparing yourself to somebody 10 years into the future will crush you is because you don't have 10 years of experience now and you want it now. You want to be able to do it now instead of starting with the first thing that gets you closer to those 10 years. And that's the only way you can do it. I mean, there's shortcuts and you can, you know, learn from experience and learn from books and learn from mentors that teach you how to avoid certain things. But you, nothing's going to happen unless you start doing one little thing at a time. It's awesome. Well, Bjorkman, for our audience, they've listened, they've heard, they're thinking, huh, maybe there's something to this email marketing thing. Where can they go to learn more? So I have a cool domain that I just bought. Yay! I don't know if you guys are in the domain buying business. but Oh, I am. <laughs> but it's writeawesomeemails.com, and that'll redirect you to my personal sort of email marketing coaching page, just where you can sign up to my email marketing manifesto. And it gives you sort of like my short ebook, if you will, that tells you exactly how I structure my email marketing and what I do to get to where I am today. I'm at 100 subscribers plus per day now. So I hope that that's a big enough of a number to sort of <laughs> qualify me as somebody that knows how email marketing works. But if you go to writeawesomeemails.com slash podcast, if you go to that URL, Without the www, just straight into the address bar, it will send you straight to the landing page where you can sign up and get that free email marketing manifesto. Now, wait a minute, Bjorkvin. I feel like maybe this whole free ebook thing might be a scheme for you to email market to people. Oh my gosh, application. Yes. Well, funny <laughs> you should say that because this is actually a brand new experiment because. I really, really love teaching people how to do this better. I really, really like showing my systems and how I structure things. And this email list is actually brand new. There is not a welcome sequence. There is nothing there. It is actually just one email. And guess what it does? It gives you the free thing. It introduces you a little bit to who I am. And it asks you about what you need help with. How can I bring more value to you as an email marketing expert, if you will? And one of the things that I'm going to do in March is I'm going to do a 31-day strategy or a 31-day challenge, if you will, to build a better email marketing campaign. And I'm going to teach you how everything that I do throughout the entire month of March. I'm taking this course called 31 Days to Build a Better Blog, and I'm using that course to teach you uh, in 31 days, how to be better email marketers. So what you'll get by signing up to the email list is hopefully value. 
I don't even have a product yet, but I will help you out if you open the emails. Well, there's an interesting thing there with Bjorkman. If you go to his page again, that's writeawesomeemails.com slash podcast. You will be taught by Bjorkman, but you can also learn by watching what he does because he's going to be doing exactly what he's talking about from this episode. He will be practicing what he preaches. So you can see both what he's teaching in his emails, but also what he's doing in these emails from a strategy standpoint. You can sort of reverse engineer it by just sort of looking at, poking around the page, if you will. Well, and let me just further endorse you as, in my opinion, I very strongly believe this. We were talking about this at NAM recently, is that in the recording industry, I think you are the number one guy for email marketing. I don't think anyone has anywhere near as much experience as you do. And that's not something to underestimate. That's not something to shake a stick at. I definitely, from my own experience, you have had a huge impact on me learning how to write decent emails. And the benefit to my business was just bananas. It was uh, tens of thousands of dollars in <laughs> extra business, just from like random people that had forgotten about me. That's awesome, man. It was just the weirdest thing where like when I started learning how to tell stories and add value, this sort of service mentality, this is all pre-podcast, guys. When I started learning how to tell stories and add value in that way, it was wild to get responses from people. It was so weird that like instantly worked. That it was like, oh, weird. That guy hasn't booked a mastering project in four years. And he just randomly booked a mastering project after getting this email because it made him like me and remember me. And freaking wild stuff. So this email marketing, this is a little different from the stuff we typically preach on the podcast, but it's not to be underestimated, nor is Bjorgman's skill in this area. So I'm <laughs> sure if you guys sign up at writeawesomeemails.com that it's going to be an amazing thing for you guys that are thinking about getting into email marketing for your business. You're giving me way too many accolades here. I'm, I'm, blu <laughs> I'm blushing. I'm literally red. Aw, <laughs> shucks. I do want to mention, I remember when we were digging into that storytelling stuff, which I think is very important, like to write and send out fun emails, you have to be able to tell stories. And I remember that story about the two guys where one of them just makes music to 80% of his ability and then publishes. And the other one like just strives for perfection every time and just doesn't get as far because quality will sort of follow quantity if you at least have a certain threshold. And I feel like 80%, as you said in that email, was a pretty good way of putting it. Because if you make a song every month at 80% and you release it, then in a year you've done 12 songs. And your 80% in January versus your 80% in December is just night and day versus the one guy with the 100% perfection mentality that's still struggling to get the snare drum right in July. Yeah. And I think there's a take home for us in this as well. And I'm speaking of somebody who had crippling fear to even sort of dabble in email marketing because it sounded evil. But this idea of like, just get started, just start on a small scale, do a small experiment and be okay with the fact that it's imperfect and get over your fear of man. This idea <laughs> of like, oh, 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 I'll lose everything. Oh gosh, I'll have to live in a box in the street. Just get over this irrational fear and take a risk by serving people. Go out, find a way to serve them. Not everyone's going to love it, but that doesn't matter. It's not how many people hate you. It's how many people love you that determines your success. Because you know what the worst thing is going to happen? It's actually nothing. Like That's the worst thing is that, is that nothing will happen. At which point you're at the same point as you were before, but now you know something and you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe that didn't work. Or maybe I should try a different strategy, you know? Really, the worst that can happen is that you learn something, period. If you've been listening to the podcast and thinking, man, I wish I could get some one-on-one -on -one help with this business stuff, I have been taking on just a couple people as one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. It was something I just wanted to kind of dabble with, and it turns out it's like my most favorite thing I do each week. It's super fun. So if you would like one-on-one -on -one business coaching to help apply some of the stuff you're learning in the podcast, check out chrisgrammastering.com slash coaching to fill out an application. I would love to hear from you.
And one last thing before you guys go, this is a really important piece of the podcast. We need a favor from you so that we can help you more. We have a survey that we have put together to help us get to know who you are, why you listen to the podcast, what we're doing well, what we could be doing better, all those things. And you can reach it at the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash survey or 6FHS.com slash survey. It's really easy. It's really short. It's going to help us get to know who you are, how we can serve you better, what we can improve, all those things. So please check it out. It is absolutely, I mean this from the bottom of my heart, the biggest thing you can do to help this podcast get better, to help us get you better information, and hopefully to help us get guests who can blow our minds with awesome wisdom bombs of knowledge and stuff. So check it out, sixfigurehomestudio.com slash survey. Like I said, this is a big deal. This survey can really help us take it to the next level. And apparently it's a normal thing to do on podcasts like this and is super duper helpful. So check it out, sixfigurehomestudio.com slash survey. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great week. Whoa.